Welcome folks to the November 8th, 2023 working group call. Uh, we have some really cool topics today uh, to discuss. This is a Hyperledger call, and so the uh, antitrust policy and the code of conduct are in effect. Please be mindful of those. Links can be found in the agenda. These are clickable things um, that uh, can help you find more information. Please raise any issues if you uh, find any uh, in any group activities. Um, is there, you're welcome to add yourself to the attendees list or make any other adjustments useful to the community to the agenda wiki page. There's the link in the chat. Um, is there anyone new today that would like to introduce themselves? Well, we are glad that everyone is here. Um, uh, any announcements that we should have on our list, but don't. Any projects would like to share release status or work updates? Uh, the Aries of Creative Project, uh, we're upgrading to um, AFJ 0 0.4. Uh, that work's in progress and the uh, work to migrate to Hyperledger is in progress as well. Excellent. I'm noticing that we don't really have a testing section. We've just had the test harness. Akrita would probably fall there. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get creative and rearrange that later. Thank you, Kim. Other updates? All right. Uh, our agenda today, uh, looking for a quick update from Alex. I know there's some uh, uh, logo stuff to uh, to talk about. Um, uh, Steven, you uh, posted in the channel about the, the draft quarterly report. Um, and so that's listed there. Uh, I have a long-term support policy as a, as a follow-up that I've been meaning to get to before this, but I'm glad I finally had time for it uh, that I would like to discuss. And then uh, any DIDCOM V2 follow-up from last time. We didn't quite have enough time, but we talked about advantages of moving, um, but would love to hear uh, conversation topics, disagreements, suggestions, anything of the sort as we consider a move to DIDCOM V2 as a target after the unqualified uh, DID work that is already going on. Um, any adjustments we want to make to the agenda before we get going? All right, uh, Alex, marketing stuff and and or logos for yeah. the Ares project. Um, very simple one from, from us. We uh, put three logo concepts on Discord, the Ares channel this last week, got some votes, and uh, we'll be selecting one this week. So that'll be updated, and then we'll just do some work in the parallel streams of the um, for Indie and non-creds to move those forwards as well. So um, all good progression, and Anybody new, Aries Marketing Group meets last Tuesday of every month. The link is in the show notes. I'm going to call them show notes. Then. So that's it. If this is a show notes, then this means this is a show. <laughs> a good and perhaps, show. And perhaps I'm more entertaining than I intend. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with that. Let's go I didn't know if we were watching this week in Aries. <laughs> this week in Aries. <laughs> Let's go see what Sam fouls up this week. This is great. <laughs> you know the you know the rule. Every group has a has a comedian in it that doesn't know they're a comedian, and if you don't know who it is, you're that person. I think, uh, <laughs> I, think I just found that. That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna add a. I mean here last couple of weeks we update the logo because um hyperledger rebranded so it's in line with that and also a chance to refresh it as well so does that work going along with a few other parallel streams of our messaging which have been updated in a few places like on the main aries landing page on the hyperledger website for example so we've got some good consistent updated messaging happening happens in a few key places that people find when they search for us so all good things Excellent. Thank you, Alex. And head over to the Discord channel if you haven't seen the logo stuff already and you would like to have a voice in uh, in the, the brand that is applied to the Aries project. The visual brand? All of the brand things. Yes, please do. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Alex, 
for all of your efforts. Uh, Steven, draft PR report. Do you want me to just pull this up or do you want to screen share? I might as well go off mute and screen share and tell you because I have it ready. So, go. whoops, not the AI companion. All right. Um, there we go. Um, so, uh, most of you know or not. Um, we uh, each project submits a quarterly report to um, the technical oversight committee at Hyperledger. Um, so I've been putting together the ones for the identity projects for a while, um, evolved them from um, previous. Um, so there's a PR in um, that I believe Sam linked to in the notes, in the show notes. Um, and we've got the, uh, so it jumps to here, um, things we cover, project health um, in this, uh, for this one, I highlighted that um, uh, the fork of the .NET, uh, the dormant .NET project um, has been created at OWF um, since, it, it really didn't affect Aries since the, the .NET framework had been touched in a long time. Um, the folks, I believe, at Lissy or ID Union took their fork and um, created it at OWF, and we archived the one here. The more interesting one is um, what we've talked about recently is the transfer of the um, AFJ repository from Hyperledger to OWF. So that's a possibility. It's been proposed, um, and um, it's being discussed, is what I told them, because that's that's the status as of now. Um, we cover the releases, overall activity that have gone on. Um, the things that I wanted to highlight here is I, I do this based on my knowledge of the community. You know, some of these are just facts. I go through and I look at what releases occurred and just record them. Um, over here, uh, things like what are the highlights? Um, I pick out the things and sometimes this list is very long. This time it's three, um, three items. Um, also remember that this covers the month of July to September 2023, so this does not cover the last month and almost a half, uh, month and a quarter, um, doesn't cover October, doesn't cover November. So um, we do have stats in here on, and these, you know, these go up and down uh, quarter by quarter. Um, there is a, um, where is it, down somewhere. Um, oh yeah, the Aries Activity Dashboard. So this is reflects the month of July to September. You can click on that. Um, I don't know if people have seen this, um, but it shows um, you know all the activity that goes on for the time period um, uh, available. So this shows things that are going on in the various repositories within Hyperledger that are associated with Aries. And there's one of these for every project. Um, then I solicit or um, add things about uh, the various libraries. So um, Patrick gave me this information about what's going on with Aries VCX, their mentorships, um, the planning on what they're going to be working on, and uh, cover uh, JavaScript, Python. I would highlight this one as well. Um, for those not aware, um, I checked in with the primary maintainers from um, formerly Secure Key, now Gen Digital, And basically I've been told um, that they're not gonna continue to evolve it. So we're gonna um, likely archive this repository, but that's a discussion actually, Sam, that we should probably put on the agenda and, and um, publish out is, is um, whether anyone is interested in evolving the Aries framework go from where the Secure fo Key folks that went to Gen Digital have left it. Um, so that's a, a, a thing that came up in putting this together. And then again, current plans are more or less things that I talked about. I appreciated getting um, the planning from Patrick. Um, I just put together the ones that I thought were appropriate and so put those there. Um, so I encourage people to review this. I'm happy to receive comments directly or via the, um, you know, the pull request um, conversations and I'll, I'll adjust as necessary based on those. 
I would add as well that there is, for those interested, there is an non-creds and an indie one as well that are uh, currently active. They, they um, have decided to put them all together in the same week for me, um, since I do all three of them and uh, works for me. I, I just put them all together uh, over time and then um, solicit uh, input from those. So these will be discussed this Thursday. Uh, so tomorrow, at the TOC call at this time. So um, same time tomorrow, there's a um, Hyperledger TOC call. Um, there's one more thing that I was gonna mention. What was it? Shoot. Um, I apologize. Um, oh, well, I have let it slip now, so. Um, Oh, I know what it was. Thank you. Phew. Um, in the first quarter, uh, the TOC this year has requested that in the first quarter of each year, each project is asked to do a, um, uh, a an annual report as opposed to a quarterly report. So something that both summarizes the entire of 2023 and um, talks about plans for 2024 and and setting up the type of thing that um, Patrick put in, which is the roadmap ideas. So um, I would I want to mention this now so that all of the groups that have Hyperledger um, Aries projects or contribute to them um, start to think about what we want to go into the annual report. And Sam, that's something we should probably put on the topic for this meeting. Um, as we get closer to that um, that period. I've got it listed in the future topics. There you go. So that will be due uh, essentially uh, three months from now. Um, and in that we will be required as a group, as a project to um, go to the TOC meeting and present the project and its annual report to the members of the TOC. So um, currently this report will just be um, presented or they'll just review it. Um, they'll look at question, ask questions, but more or less, um, if you will, rubber stamp it. I mean, everyone, everyone on the TOC does read the reports and sort of gets an understanding of where things are, um, but there's not a lot of back and forth. And the intention of the annual report is to look more deeply at the issues and um, consider more questions. A member of the TOC will be assigned to um, the project. Somebody from a, another project will be assigned to look at this and ask awkward questions of the, um, of the team presenting the annual report. Perhaps not ask awkward questions, just questions. And that's it. Awesome. I'm desperately trying not to make an awkward joke about your mustache there, Stephen. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm just teasing a little. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my daughter said, you need to show me what you look like with a mustache. So it's got to happen on November 1st. And Excellent. so there you go. Love that. Um, that so for a while, for a while, I had it this way all the way down to here and i actually went out in public like that it really looked bad but nobody said anything but there you are sam without <laughs> even you know after it's been trimmed three times and there you say make some awkward comment about it wow i grow facial hair very slowly and patchily and so there's a reason you rarely see me attempting to grow something. I have an old passport picture with a beard and it looks terrible and it was a huge long effort to, to grow it at all. So I, I, I mean no derision there. You clearly succeed at this more than I do. <laughs> well, at least it's blonde so you can't see it, but evidently you can see it. So there you go. <laughs> so, um, awesome. Uh, you are gonna edit the um, recording to remove this seg segment of the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's streaming live to YouTube, Stephen. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> it's too late. It's out there. This yeah. is actually AI. Uh, I'm I'm just using a, a filter. A filter. Yeah, yeah. The, we'll go with the, the filter. filter. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. Uh, 
So at the tail end, Stephen, I have to thank you for your work with the quarterly reports. You have been doing the quarterly reports for a long time now. It's a relatively thankless job, and you do a fantastic job and well represent our community and the work that we all do. So I am uh, super grateful and thank you on behalf of all of us yeah. uh, for your work doing so. Well, I, it's not it's not difficult. I know what's going on and, and able to do that. But the biggest thing I want is somebody to take a look and say, call me out on what I've missed or interpreted badly. So um, I do encourage people to take a look at that and and with a critical eye and and put your two cents worth in as well. And here's the link in the in the uh, yeah. in the agenda today that takes you right to that yeah. pull request as well. Um, and then also, if you have interest in the other projects that Stephen is prepping reports for, then that's also there. Although I'm assuming that's going to come up in the relevant meetings. Uh, excellent. Any other topics on the uh, on the draft PR for the quarterly report? Okay. I would like to talk briefly about uh, this. Uh, this is an Aries RFC um, uh, for long term support. Um, there was a conversation uh, that I had with Hitachi um, that they had requested and what they conveyed um, in that they a bunch of useful information I've reported on this previously, but what they conveyed was that um, for uh, some development teams that are not is quite on the on the cutting edge of identity itself, but that want to use Aries, it's very helpful to have um, clear expectations around uh, around their activities and new releases that actually come out. And so they had pointed to, and I have linked down here, the um, the Hyperledger Fabric uh, release strategy. You'll notice they have Fabric RFCs, and, and this is one of them. And uh, mine is a little less verbose as a first draft. Uh, and so, um, but uh, here's what I have adapted and, and, and pulled in given both the, the Fabric um, and also conversations with Itachi and conversations that we've had here. And so I want to talk about this because this impacts all of our uh, all of our projects um, in the sense, of course, the Aries it doesn't generally do things super wide, um, but but rather is is a collection of projects that work along for common goals. And so this is intended to highlight a common goal, and uh, and I'm presented here for for feedback and uh, and and maybe some confirmation that this isn't an insane plan. Um, the, uh, the the motivations are, are kind of obvious here, but but written out, um, not very verbose, and perhaps they could. One thing to note is that uh, it's recommended, when possible, to designate an, a long-term support release when a project reaches compliance with some interop profile, Aries interop profile, or other. Um, in that way, uh, those interested in adopting uh, that uh, you know support for that profile have a, a long-term support release um, aligned with that. Um, so here's the basics of, of what happens. Um, the idea is, is that projects will tag a release uh, when they are designated as long-term support, and they do so by including the letters LTS after the version number whenever it's indicated. So either in a, in a release tag inside of a, a GitHub, in documentation for the project, etc. Uh, the readme file needs to, to contain, uh, indicate which version is the LTS release, um, and it should say f also formers. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to the support timeline here. But basically, the README uh, in the repo contains the, the LTS-related information, the long-term support version-related information, with links to where you can go to actually pull that. And then here's the idea. Here's what a long-term support release means. Each long-term support release must be supported for at least nine months after the next long-term support release is designated. Uh, nine months uh, is... Uh, a, a balance between um, needing enough time for a development team to become aware that they need to move uh, from one long-term support release to another one if that's their desire, um, and, and so to have sufficient development time for both discovery and then the development work to do so, but uh, but not so long as to place a, a, a very long burden on top of the developers um, or the maintainers of each project. Uh, so when you when the next uh, long-term support release is designated, then the prior release then gets an updated end of support date that's at least nine months in the future. I uh, I waffled on this a little bit uh, as I was writing this and decided to include at least it doesn't have to be nine months. Uh, a project could decide to support it in excess of nine months 
depending on the nature of the project, the frequency of updates, et cetera. And so that, uh, and, and what type of code it actually is, but a, a minimum of nine months. And then you state the date. Uh, and then um, you have to support it on it for the release on the date published. That's the goal is that as a community, if you want to exceed the nine months, then you have to commit to doing it and, and, and rolling back that date and making it shorter is, uh, is something that should not be done. Um, uh, projects can uh, designate a long-term support release with any cadence desired by the project. There is, there's no limitation on the frequency that you can do this um, from, a, from a legit, an organizational perspective. From a logistical perspective, it does have an effect because if you, for example, release a long-term support every three months, then you're going to end up with a collection of, of long-term support releases that need to continue receiving support. Um, and so, um, you know, coordinating with the community for the timing of long-term support releases uh, may help decrease those support efforts um, to, to do so. Um, and, and so it's, it's entirely possible, for example, the project decides to go uh, and have a major version update or something similar, and, and, and that's worth doing. Um, not written in here, but good advice um, is the... Um, is to not necessarily designate the first release of a, of a, of a major release as a long-term support release um, because there are inevitably bugs and, and, and patches and lots of updates that sort of need to happen. And so allowing that to stabilize a little bit is a good idea. Uh, lots of projects, for example, will have like the dot two release uh, or the dot four release um, they will designate as the long-term support release. I um, didn't think that the, the being so rigid was necessary in how we actually did our version numbering. Um, but uh, but as guidance that will that will apply. And then here uh, during the release uh, period, then security updates must be applied. Um, uh, you can also include bug fixes that impact the usability of the release is important, but each update must not contain uh, include API updates, programmatic interface changes like for libraries, et cetera, or major logic changes. And this allows for easier update to the sort of update, you know, the, the, the patch release of a, of a long-term support um, release for the project and um, uh, for those that are relying on, on, uh, on the projects to do that. Um, that's enough talking for me. Uh, I am really interested in hearing what folks think about this approach and uh, its impact on our uh, projects within the ARIES ecosystem and, uh, and uh, changes that ought to be made to what I've proposed here. So my first feedback here, Sam, is that um, tagging the release number with long-term support, I don't think is um, a good way to do that tagging. Um, I think it's better if the, the project just defines which version numbers are long-term uh, release, such as, uh, AFJ indicating that 0, uh, 0, 0.7.0 is a long-term release. And so the whole 0 0.7 branch would be a long-term release cycle. Can you say more? Um, so, uh, for example, uh, Ubuntu, uh, they have long-term uh, releases. Um, and they don't tag the release number as a long-term release but they will indicate in their documentation which numbers are long-term release. Is there a reason you know that they do that? Um, uh, my concern would be um, uh, importing libraries and things like that, uh, adding a, a string onto the um, version number might be problematic for imports. So uh, you're indicating that you might want to go back and designate a release as a long-term support release after it's already been tagged and changing the tag would be problematic in that way. Is that what well, is that you're saying? No, what I'm indicating is, is it might be problematic in uh, the uh, imports. So if you're importing a long-term release, um, it might cause problems in the uh, dependency systems like NPM or Yarn or Poetry or something. And including LTS in the version tag is makes that problematic. I it could. Uh, I'm not sure, but I thought I'd mention that as a possible issue. Okay. Thank you.
Other thoughts? I think it it makes sense to do this. Uh, the hard part is declaring an LTS. <laughs> when do you decide? That's that's tricky. It is a little. The only the only thing that this actually says about it right now um, is that it's recommended to align with the adoption of of some sort of interop profile. Right. That's right. the only thing it says right now. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is useful is that if this mechanism is known, then it's a conversation that could be could happen within a specific, you know, the, a meeting uh, related to a specific code project to say, hey, we would love another, you know, there's features that we want, but we uh, the, the needs we have as a as a user of it, um, you know, need LTS releases, you know, can we can we motivate the creation of one? so that we can adopt these features and, and move from our previous LTS to this one. Um, and so it's left intentionally vague, not because I was trying to be painful, but because yeah. I wanted to allow each of the projects to designate an LTS support release as, as useful. One of the things that aligning with an interrupt profile does is it means that in theory, um, let's say we, we 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 make finalize AIP3, right? Um, and which I should indicate that we're not massively close to, um, but let's say we finalize AIP3 and uh, Aries VCX and Akapai both release a version that, uh, that implements AIP3. Um, and that designated as a long-term support uh, if they both align kind of around the, the interop profile, whatever version numbers they happen to be, you could then go look up the interop profile and say, oh, here's the long-term support releases that, that adopt this, which means uh, that you could then pick up, a, you know, VCX and, um, and uh, an Akapai and of their long-term support releases and expect them to work together. Um, so rather than sort of requiring uh, or, or trying to move towards a more rigid like version number alignment system, which I think would be really problematic, this gives a way to understand which of the ARIES projects can be expected to align in that. And so one of the things that may happen is that um, we could adapt the AIP so that not only do you indicate which projects actually support it, but you might actually designate the release that is indicated um, or that uh, is... Um, has been marked as a long-term support release of that profile, which I think could be an interesting mechanism for communities. Other thoughts? Uh, aligning around, uh, just a thought, but like aligning around the interrupt profile, uh, in my mind, makes it easier to have LTS releases that are far and wide apart because there's a lot of churn while this stuff is in development. So it's difficult to decide where in the churn do we uh, cut a release. But having an interrupt profile or things at the protocol layer, like say the adoption of DIDCOM v2. Uh, signify an LTS release, I think makes a lot of sense and helps us to spread those further apart. Thank you, Colton. Other thoughts? trying to make Nathan proud of my lengthy pauses. Hey everyone, this is Jorge. I have a, a comment or a question. Um, what is the relationship with an LTS and um, 
you know, a major release in the versioning schemes that I'm seeing for some of the Aries repos, Akapai being the the one that seems to have the longest history, going back to 2009, there's, there's still not a single, or there's not a major release. Um, what's the rationale for that? Well, there's two questions there. First, I'll state that uh, from an LTS perspective, there is intentionally no link between the actual version number used and the designation of an LTS uh, release. Um, because I, I, I mean, just observing the different, you know, versioning uh, within the projects, it seemed like that would be a really huge change. And I was trying to not go for a huge change while still getting the benefit. And as far as the second answer, I'll, I'll yield the floor to Steven. Um, bad decision making. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We, we declared a, a while ago that AIP2 would be the 1.0 release, and um, but we were mo far more concerned on smaller um, items than we were with getting down the last pieces of AIP2. We've been, you know, we've had AI, most of AIP2 functionality for a very long time, um, but there were certain few things that weren't there, and we just never changed that that policy that idea that it would be and it was just dumb it, there should have been a 1.0 long 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 ago yeah. and it should have been an lts so i that's why i'm trying to think about what to do right now with yeah you know, now i've got another one which is when do we drop um uh when do we drop support for the indie sdk um do we do LTS before or after we do that? And and that's uh, where I'm going. Yeah. So for, from from an implementer's perspective, at least in, you know my experience, yeah, the decision of sticking with an LTS or or jumping up to a you know major release that that's where it be, the decision becomes a lot more clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so might might aid you know future developers in, in incorporating or integrating these these frameworks. It, Absolutely, it becomes a lot easier. Yeah, it's just it's just been a dumb series of decisions. Yeah, that's where I I'm at, Daniel. Hindsight Daniel. is always easier, Stephen. Don't it uh, is? Don't oh, absolutely. Don't talk too much about this. Yeah. Uh, Kim, your hands up. Yeah. Um, the other thing probably worth mentioning here is in the uh, tagging strategy um, uh, or the version numbering, uh, there needs to be a way to include uh, uh, new tags that have the minor or uh, bug fix updates. And so if we're going to be specifying, you know, how to tag things here, um, whatever tagging format they pick, they, they need a way to do subsequent bug fix releases. Um, with additional tagging. That's excellent, Kim. Thank you. Daniel has passionate feelings about your comments, Stephen, in the chat, if you hadn't been watching that. Um, uh, I saw that. <laughs> so I have a thought, and this is one of our accomplishment. We have reached the point, we've passed the point where the utility of the projects that we have exceeds our ability to stay on the newest thing released. Meaning we have people that desire to adopt this and they know that they're not gonna stay on the cutting edge of what's developed and they have utility out of it anyway. And so the the, the fact that, that we're now adopting an LTS policy, which we probably should have done a while ago and I'm grateful to, to Hitachi for the encouragement, is a sign that the older versions are sufficient for many use cases and that uh, and, and this designation of an LTS makes it, it very easy to adopt the stable pieces of what we have done in the past. And so we should consider that a, 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 a milestone that we have crossed 
um, and that uh, and that we have developed enough utility within our uh, within our projects that uh, that this type of not cutting edge adoption is uh, is considered valuable, and I think that's fantastic. So that's not a change necessarily, but just commentary on the fact that the fact that we're talking about this and, and we have community members that have requested this sort of a thing is a, is a good sign that that uh, that we have we have done excellent work. Uh, Colton, your hand is up. So something that I didn't really see you recorded here, but I think is very valuable and important. And granted, I love uh, our release notes that we have so far, but I do believe that for LTS releases, we, sh uh, we need to have release notes between the LTS releases containing all the changes in between, as well as any gotchas for upgrading between those releases because these are supposed to be the stable upgrade paths. Oh, you didn't say this, but this is what I thought you were going to say, so I'm going to add it anyway. Um, is that the LDS patches also need very clear release notes. But having, uh, you know, a, 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 a release note, um, you know, a consolidated, you know, release note thing, um, I think is excellent. You're right, because this, this does represent the stable upgrade path. Super good. Other comments? Does anyone hate this idea? Is this a terrible plan? Or is it too heavy as a community for us to do this? This is a long overdue plan and we should do it. Um, and, and each of the leads of the project should um, get together and decide how to adopt this. Is this more like the pirate code where each project can take this recommendation and um, pick the portions that best apply to them? So for example, um, uh, perhaps the load testing framework, long-term release doesn't include nine months after the release of the next long-term release. I think that we should do intelligent things and if those intelligent things feel wrong according to this, this ought to be amended as, as we get smarter. Um, so if we have a discussion and think, wow, like this really doesn't apply very well or needs some, some, uh, you know, some adjustments or some commentary to, to fix it, then, then absolutely yes. The, there's no, the, the long-term support policy itself will not get angry with us, right? And so we, we, we should seek to do the correct thing. Um, and, uh, and I believe that largely this is the correct thing for most of what we're talking about as we discover things that don't align very well or that need to be appropriately adjusted. And I can't, it, uh, there may be things uh, like around the long-term support release. So, so for around the testing, um, uh, you know, it, it may not be appropriate uh, or maybe super appropriate to handle the the long-term support releases differently because of the of the nature of those projects. But the general comment is is that this should adapt to do the right thing, whatever the right thing is. Does that address your your comment, Kim? Mostly. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so from an Aries wide gr group perspective, approving uh, this is the um, is the action we take. The separate projects themselves then discuss how this actually applies. I imagine that there will be uh, notes in the project readme about it. It does not have to be as long as this. Um, but uh, but that the indicate the required information and then perhaps link to this uh, to this RFC that uh, that get us there.
other recommendation is uh, that for a long-term uh, release, uh, the project should uh, maintain a separate branch for the long-term release to uh, support the bug fixes. That was in my brain, but was not written. I will, I will add that. That's really good. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I've gotten excellent feedback, which was my point. Um, I will incorporate this feedback uh, into uh, this PR. And then on a revisit, uh, ideally next week, um, we can decide as a community to adopt this. And one of the things that I may want to do, or I may propose as part of that, is that we go past proposed here. Is that we is that we go to adopted for 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 an RFC status, um, you know, far more rapidly than we do. This is a concept RFC, not a feature RFC. And so uh, and so we should do that. It might make sense to wait for uh, several groups to attempt uh, to uh, organize their efforts around this prior to that uh, adjustment. Um, but that, that I think that we should seek to, for a status change faster than normal um, against these uh, against these things. Any other comments on long-term support release policy? Excellent, thank you for the feedback. That's what I was hoping for um, and that's excellent. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is to uh, talk about a, the DIDCOM V2 discussion that we had last week. We had, uh, I had just enough time to sort of share stuff and not very much time for comments. And so I wanted to allow some time on the agenda for any relevant discussion around the adoption of DIDCOM V2 as a, as a, as a sort of a restated clarifying point we would seek to do this after uh, having made the requisite uh, uh, necessary progress on unqualified DIDs. And so the dates for that are sooner and the dates for DIDCOM V2 adoption are later um, because it's, it's a bit of a prerequisite. Um, but any, uh, any concepts or, or questions or disagreements or absolutely anything uh, related to uh, the adoption of DIDCOM V2 within ARIES projects. No opinions at all. Other than I'm heavily biased and I think that we should get it implemented. You're right. I didn't call it that you shared that in, in chat, but Colton did make that comment in chat as well. We have uh, added Combi 2 on our roadmap. Uh, for our SBCX, so definitely in our plans. Sorry, was that, I, I lost who, who said that. Was that Patrick or? Yeah, that was me, that's right. Excellent. Uh, I, I suppose that will be coming 
2024. Maybe just, uh, uh, you know, sc scouting and exploring now in uh, toward the end of the year, uh, seeing what the challenges are. But uh, uh, I don't expect it uh, earlier than 24. I mean, I'd love to see it, but I don't have a magic way to do it. So I don't have any way of, I don't, I don't know the path to get there. I, I, we've got so much, uh, we've got lots that we're doing and, um, you know, continue not to see, um, where that weighs against the other things we're working on. So other, other community members, we would more than welcome stepping up and and um, taking that um just uh don't see it with the with the priorities we have right now i think um Patrick, you mentioned 2024, and I think 20, you know, 2024 is is when, yeah, we're obviously not talking about before the end of this year, um, and so I think that that is is a reasonable expectation there. Um, I think uh, this is important. We have an opportunity within Akapai to uh, to fill in that and, and contribute uh, updates that will add did come v2 support. Um, I, this is going to take a refactor in, in, in most of our projects because of some of the assumptions about message flow and processing. Um, it's not a crazy refactor, but it, but it will likely re, uh, require a refactor uh, to do so, including the abstraction of having possibly more than one inbound message type that, that occurs. Um, and so there, there, is, there is work there. Uh, just a question here. I'm wondering about the AATH. Is there uh, any uh, thoughts on adding Bitcoin V2 test suits to AATH in the you know, upcoming time? I guess that would be helpful for all the implementers if they have something to check against. That's a good question and would be excellent for compatibility testing. Uh, Colton also asked in the chat if anyone happens to know what the status is of Didcom V2 for AFJ. I don't know if anyone here happens to know what the status of that is. Okay. Um, I think that um, here's that branch. So Daniel highlights that AATH challenge needs at least one didcom v2 implementations to test against first because of its method of testing agents to get against agents. So we kind of need at least one agent to be. Can you run AATH against itself? Is that a current accepted configuration? Like, meaning, can you test agent A against agent A? Yes. Okay, so if we get one that speaks Didcom v2, it can at least be tested with itself to update the Ares agent test harness. Um, and then and we can make that work. The the Ares agent test harness itself does not actually touch Didcom, is that correct? Or, or are there aspects of it that are aware of Didcom messages? I believe that's correct. It's all the test harness touches as back channels to the agents to trigger actions, I think. Which means that, uh, yeah, which means that in theory, it should not require massive updates. 
Um, there may be some updates uh, necessary to in order to cause it to test didcom v2 as, as opposed to didcom v1 support. And I imagine for many projects, uh, supporting both during a transition period will be useful. Um, and so there, there may be some updates there. But if as soon as we have an implementation, then we can we can make that happen. And then here's the link to the AFJ um, Okay. Excellent. Um, and so uh, I've, I've written out a possible early 2024 target. By early, I mean first half. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and so we can talk about that. Um, one of the things about the community coordinated update here that, that, that became more obvious to me later is that the, the structure of the community coordinated updates have maybe I'm wrong about this, but have not, um, we incorporate code bases and deployments in the steps. And so um, one of the things that, um, that when we're picking dates we could do is, is we pick dates for code bases to be updated and then pick you know, desired targets for deployments as well. Um, and so that may be something that we want to call out a little more obviously. There's a step 1A and a step 1B in the sense that A is the code base is being ready <clears throat> and, and step 1B is that, uh, is that deployments have begun. It's worth noting that we don't all have to accomplish the code base updates before deployments begin for step 1, um, but, uh, but we, we, we have to get all the way through to the, you know, both code bases and deployments before step 1 is complete. Um, which is necessary. And so I, uh, I will apply some dates and I, I said that I would do that. Um, uh, you know, we talked about this last time and I said I was gonna update it and didn't get that done. Um, I, I, I dumped energy into the, um, into the LTS policy instead because I wanted to move that forward. And so I will, I will seek to get that updated and then, and then also uh, you know, seek some possible uh, 2024 targets as well um to uh that we might consider as a community for did come be to adoption again these are community selected dates which means that they are best effort in the sense that we've there's a lot going on and everything else but if we seek to arrive at the same time as a community that's or roughly the same time that's that's helpful for our development cool uh that's some conversation i did definitely uh hope to have today are there other things that we want to bring up on the call in the remaining few minutes. Stephen, I have the state of AFGO and the, and the annual report um, on the list of future topics there to, to bring up in future meetings as well. Good, thank you. All right, I think we should call it. Thanks everyone for coming, grateful for your feedback and all of your efforts, and we will uh, see you next week. All right, thanks guys. Thank you.